I can't wait to tell our audience today about how, what? how we met our guests because it's going to be a funny story. Ooh. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Going Analog podcast in which three board gamers bring a different game and topic to discuss. I'm your host, Christina Ha, and we met today's guest, as Shu mentioned, uh, at a party during Gen Con. He proceeded to introduce himself as the director of HR at Panda Game Manufacturing, which is a fantastic games manufacturer. Uh, So that was neat. But eventually he got around to saying he's also a game designer and they were things like Between Two Cities, The Search for Planet X, The Search for Lost Species. And Shu and I were just like dumbfounded. Why would you lead with that at a Gen Con party and not tell us the games you design first, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a humble guy. <laughs> it's like, I'm the director of HR. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose also well, our guest, Ben Rossett, didn't know that the Search for Series is my absolute favorite deduction game series, but, but yes. Hi, Ben. <laughs> Hello. If I had known that, I definitely would have led with it. (laughs) I Um, think being at a panda party, I wanted to lead with panda. But thank you very much for the kind introduction. Of course. I think think Ben did it more humbly, right? Like he's not going around, guess who I am? I'm the designer. I mean, he was bragging about being the director of HR, I guess, right? (laughs) Uh, he's also recently co-designed with Matthew Mc- O'Malley, First in Flight, published by Artonic Games, and the upcoming Fromage, a midweight simultaneous worker placement game about making cheese, which I'm very excited about, published by Road to Infamy Games. Um, so super excited to talk to you about all of these things and your design process and a bunch of different topics that we're going to get to real soon. So um, what's your topic for us today, Ben? Uh, My topic today is second editions of games, uh, Mm -hmm. games that are re-released and uh, and other types of uh, kind of second editions or other types of uh, 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 products, uh, you know, in the universe of original games. Yeah, because there's quite a variety of how different game publishers have done that and designers, too. So interested to break those down. And of course, everybody's relieved to know Shu is here with me today, too. Hi, Shu. Why would people be relieved I have to change my intro to you every right. every every episode. I think I'm supposed to be here. Yes, yeah. yeah. What's our topic going in on this topic for today? So our topic, uh, Ben's designed some very thematic games uh, with mechanics that seem like we haven't played all your upcoming games, uh, but they all seem the ones we have played like they're very tied to the mechanics in some ways. So we're curious about just sort of picking your brain and seeing how does Ben, the designer, kind of go through and tie his themes to his games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, because I love the themes that you've picked and have had a really fun time with that. Um, We will start off, though, by highlighting a recent game um, and asking our guests to talk up a game also. So we each have a game today. Um, I'll start off with Chronologic, Paris 1920. I do love me a deduction game, as we've discussed. And this is a new one from um, designed by Fabian Gridel and Johan Levitt. Uh, LeVay, designers of Turing Machine, another fascinating deduction thing. And they've been going on a tear with this series of like different ways of doing deduction where it will give you that information in different ways. Um, So previously, we'd also played Archaeologic, which was more of like deducing where shapes would fit within this temple. And now for Chronologic, it it reminded me a lot of playing Clue, um, but a much better game than Clue. So (laughs) um, very light, I'd say, out of all of the other deduction games that they've played. Um, So you are trying to, in one of three scenarios, you have several puzzles in each scenario, and uh, you figure out where people are at certain times of the night um, at this Paris opera by posing questions about either a location and the time of night or a person um, and their location. So as you find out more information by sticking a card in uh, behind a cardboard thingy thing. Uh, oh, good, good <laughs> yeah. job. Good job. Well articulate this. today. Um, the official term. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the thingy thing. It will reveal how many times this person has gone through this room or, um, you know, how many people were in this room at a certain time of night. So you start... Uh, narrowing things down and you can solve a murder. You may need to trace where a necklace was at the beginning of the night, where it got passed off through the thieves and where it ended up, things like that. So I found it really approachable, have ha- showed it to a lot of friends and it's a really good sort of beginner's deduction game, I think. So I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so where to say this and it's not because you're here, Ben, it's <laughs> you're here because of what I'm about to say. 
uh, the search for series, search for Planet X, search for Lost Species, the new one, search for Planet, uh, search UAPs. for UAPs. <laughs> um, but uh, they kind of ruined logic deduction games as a genre for us because uh, we like <laughs> them so much. <laughs> <laughs> but search for Planet X was just so good. I'm like, I could not go back to playing any others. And then, uh, so this this is the one that we use as an example, like uh, to our friends, like if you want to play uh, a game like this where you're trying to use logic, you're trying to deduce things and then try to piece together a puzzle and feel really smart in the process. Uh, this is the shining example of that game now, once it came out. Um, and we love Search for Lost Species even more. Now the uh, Chronologic came out and then now to me it's like, oh, there's another game that kind of lives up there with me uh, or kind of in that same kind of status in terms of I really enjoy it. But I I like that they can kind of live side by side because it's it's also very thematic in terms of like who killed the detective or who was alone in a room at at what they trying to solve these mysteries. Very thematic, um, but it's shorter, so it's mm -hmm. a little bit. I think if I was playing with less experienced players, I would show them chronologic. If I was playing with gamers who are like I really want a pu good puzzle, I have an hour uh, or so, then I would take them to the search for uh, series. So. Uh, yeah, I like them both very much, but yeah, chronologic uh, is is really excellent because just how easy it is to jump into, how streamlined it is, and how thematic it is. People have a lot to glom onto because it is very clue like you know what happened in this room with this particular character. So uh, I think there's a lot of uh, you know easy entry into that too. So. I, I really liked Turing Machine, and you said mm -hmm. the, the same design. I haven't played uh, chronologic, but is this also does not require an app? Right, like because Turing Correct. Machine didn't need an app; you could do everything, which is what impressed me. I, I couldn't even think of how do I, would I make Search for Planet X work without an app, but they figured out a way to do it with Turing Machine. I was super impressed. So yeah, um, yeah, I would I would love to give these these other games a shot as well. Yeah, we actually had a Scorpion uh, Masque. Masque on the podcast to kind of go over it because we we're also like, how, how did do you, this happen? How do you make a game like Turing Machine? It's like it's that's everyone's first impression. It's just impressively made because it's all all the different clues you get are done via these cutouts uh, and putting different cards that are revealing different bits of information. Uh, and it's you just get a bit of that DNA and chronologic, but like yeah, this is a much, much simpler lighter. and lighter sort of game. Uh, and yeah, they did a fantastic job with it. But they're doing a whole series in different settings because there right. are only like fifteen puzzles per game. But uh, but it's it's good time. It's good time. Yeah, it's perfect. perfect. It kind of. I was going to say it kind of leads into what my topic is going to be later Ooh. because I said there's two games in the series already, um, and they're standalone games. How how much do they overlap? Uh, would you say it's uh, like more than Ticket to Ride, Ticket to Ride Europe, or Search for Planet X, Search for Lost Species? Do those two chronologic and the other one share more DNA, or are they are they more different? I'd say they're pretty different because the archaeologic is more like. A visual spatial placement of of pieces essentially, okay. and that plays very very quickly. While I think Chronologic feels more like a deduction, like murder mystery type of game. So uh, for me, I, I I actually much prefer Chronologic. But yeah. do you, do you mean between the different Chronologics? I think you no, mean, I meant archae archaeologic oh, okay. yeah. Chronologic. So yeah. they're not only thematically different, but they also have quite a bit of uh, difference in. In, um, mechanics as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. That they both one. have like a non app uh, reader that gives you clues, but I'd say the archaeologic one is clunkier. It's a little strange. It's got this wheel mm -hmm. thing. It's like a cool thing. That one like, also, I think, exercises, archaeologic exercises a different part of your brain because it's like figuring out uh, uh, polyamino pieces and how they mm -hmm. fit onto the board. So, kind of, right. it has that aspect because there are a lot of games like that. Yeah. Of like, okay, how do these Tetris pieces all fit on the board? And you're getting clues about what's in different rows and columns. So it's a it's kind of different puzzle. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think out of all the ones we've named, including your games, Ben, uh, mm -hmm. I think this is probably the easiest for again for like a someone newer to the genre to get into. But meanwhile, but still something like like we played I all these games, it. we still yeah, really yeah. enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and then we had some friends we introduced Chronologic to, and they fell in love. And then, but the, and then we're like, okay, the next thing you need to play now is the search for planet oh, X, yeah. search for lost species. So there's a kind of a graduation Natural there. Natural feeding is laying into well, that. Thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. And oh, we add sure. it to the list. Chronologic, <laughs> yeah, archaeologic yeah. to pick up for me. Yeah. Shu also had a different game to talk about today. So. Yeah. So normally, uh, 
Christine and I, as Going Analog, we're, we bring one game for the podcast to discuss, and our guest brings one. We're bringing two today. Uh, the one I'm bringing is Sacred Valley from North Star Games. Then the reason why uh, we're doing two games is because we, we're, we're kind of behind, truthfully, Gen in terms of... backlog. <laughs> yeah, so these are both uh, media copies that we received, and we're trying like, we wanted to play them at some point. The company sent them to us. We're trying to cover them. And then we want to get through these. But uh, Sacred Valley, so this is a game that takes place in Peru and during the Inca uh, civilization time. And it's about farming in this valley. Uh, and they, they use a kind of this tiered, almost a semi-communal system of farming. And you learn actually a lot. They have a lot of flavor text in the rule book that you can skip over if you don't care about kind of stuff. But it kind of it gives you a lot of history about what this game is based on. So that kind of, I, I really liked it because it just gives more, gives more context for what, what you're doing. Uh, but so in Sacred Valley, what you're doing is it's very simple. Uh, there's this kind of central farmland that you're all uh, planting crops on. And then you could take a tile, like a potato, was potato one? Actually, I should check that. <laughs> um, like car- uh, chili peppers, like peppers. You could plant one tile onto this grid and then in a future turn, whether you or another player plants another pepper tile right next to that, it grows that crop. And then the more it grows, the more everyone could benefit from it if you want. So oh, it's not a cooperative game. It's not even semi-co-op, but there's parts of it where like you have to think about, do I want to make this crop bigger because it's also going to help other people? Um, and then you can also, when you start to harvest bigger and bigger crops, you get these harvest points that you can turn in for money. The money can be used to either grow different types of crops. You can expand the types of crops you can grow, or you can start to buy more tiles and then figure out. So it's, it has some slight engine building to it. Um, but what makes this game really appealing to me is I feel like there's sort of like, we all acknowledge just gateway games, right? Like sort of the games you would introduce to someone who has a been in our hobby you know they're like right. they're maybe used to the monopolies of the world or clues and unos and they're ready for something better and then you introduce in the gateway games like ticket to ride or a tr- you know things like that this to me almost fits in a category but just like one step in like okay if they want something uh that's really really simple to get into but it has an extra layer because of the engine building uh, this is a great one to have because it's it's super easy to teach it feels really rewarding you in no time you just like oh if I just do this and this I could just get a lot of money instantly cash that out and now I have a ton of money I could buy these things on top of the crops and then the it, getting new types of crops or getting more crops you can also get special powers from these assistants that gives you asymmetrical little uh, bits that either let you break some rules give you end game points or both uh, so and that adds a little bit of an element too so but all of these things like it's like. If you you have a friend who's like, you're not ready to teach them Agricola or Caverna, uh, but they want something a little bit like the next step in, next step above a Ticket to Ride or a Carcassonne, uh, Sacred Valley is is an excellent fit for that. Also, episode. there are alpaca meeples. So there's that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really cute. Yeah. Dan, how does it how does it play? Shu, how does it play with two? Uh, because, you know, it seems like it might be a little zero sum with uh, the two players kind of playing off of each other. Does it play well at two players? That's a good question. I've only played it uh, three and four. Uh, so I've not played it two player. And then Christina, actually, you have, I don't think you've played it, right? No. Why yeah. are you gaming without me? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I don't, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know that, but I think because of the, uh, the, uh, different powers that you get from the helpers, right? That it starts to kind of branch off a little bit because now I might be, there might be a power that says all seeds only cost one coin uh, rather than there's a scale depending on how deep into the market you want to buy. So that might change your tactics and things like that. Uh, But it's a, it's, it's not very, even though you're all building on the same uh, amount of land, it's not very cutthroat. It's not, well, I, I take that back. I did have a couple of moments where my friend could see that I was about to do something big and he did try to block me. Uh, so that is possible, but it's not too mean of a game. Again, it's very, very approachable. Uh, and I like the very light engine building kind of aspects to this because uh, by the end of the game, it really starts to ramp up. It kind of teaches you these elements like like the engine building, uh, the eight, the different powers you can get from these assistants and things like that at a, a very nice pace. But by the end, you feel pretty powerful. You're like, I just made a lot of money, not going to spend that money, and all these kind of things. So 
Yeah, mm-hmm. very nice light game, uh, Sacred Valley from North Star Games. Excellent. And Ben, you brought this game too. <laughs> I did. The game I'm going to talk about is uh, is a little bit older. It's Century Spice Road or Century Golem Edition, and it's mm-hmm. not in my uh, my reach right now to pick it up and put it in front of the camera, but. It's a game that I've played quite a bit and just got back to recently. I played it a few weeks ago and remembered how much I liked it. And I thought, well, that might be something interesting to talk about on the podcast. And so I dove into it a little bit because there's uh, um, in so in Century Spice Road, uh, if somebody hasn't played, you are basically a spice trader. You are gaining spices uh, from these pools of uh, four different kinds of spices And then you're using cards that you engine building cards that you bring into your hand to trade and upgrade those spices to eventually buy victory point cards. So then you're just trading in the spices uh, on creating recipes on recipe cards and exchanging them for victory points. Uh, Player with the most points at the end wins. Uh, And so the game is often compared to Splendor, a very straight engine building type of game. Um, And I dug into the math of it a little bit. Uh, Because I wanted to see kind of how this game works. And, um, you know, there's some uh, talk online about it. Mm. Um, Basically, each card that you uh, have in your hand that you'll buy into into your hand will give you between two and four points of upgrade when you play that card, which means that it will uh, increase the value of the gems that it is that is converting the trades that it's making. Uh, between two bumps up in increase in value or three bumps up or four bumps up. There is even, actually, there are five cards in the deck. I went through the entire deck that only give you a one-point bump. Um, And this was really interesting because when you actually start to take a look at the cards, you can see that a lot of them are strictly better than other cards that you can buy in the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was interested in this. Why would this happen? Why would the designer uh, do this? Uh, and create cards that are strictly better than others, where it's very easy to math out uh, how valuable a card is and how many bumps that it's going to give you uh, on the increases. Um, The the most common ones are either a two-point or a three-point bump, but there are uh, eight cards uh, that give you uh, a four-point bump. Um, And I think that uh, the reason that this works in the game is the economy that's set up and the river of how the cards flow. Uh, uh, the upgrade cards that you can buy are in a river. Mm-hmm. The ones that are closest to you are free. And then you have to pay a gem for each card uh, to buy cards deeper into the river. And so I think this is what allows the economy of the game to work uh, because you might see one of those four bump cards uh, that's coming down the river, and obviously everybody would rather get that card, uh, but it's a little bit of a game of chicken almost in who's going to pay for it first mm-hmm. to go get that card as it's coming down the river. So if everybody has played the game before and kind of knows the math of the game, uh, there's kind of a an equilibrium point there at which probably you're willing to pay one or two gems for four bump card you're willing to pay one gem for a three bump card and Mm. no gems for a one or a two bump card Mm -hmm. Uh, and so uh the game is kind of uh almost like an arbitrage situation i think where you're just looking for little opportunities to get one bump or two bumps up on your opponent and so if uh if your opponents have let a valuable card come down the river one bump too far closer to you and you can get that four bump card cheaper, uh, you should grab it right away because every time you play it, you're going to get more and more value out of it. Uh, so uh, I thought that that was, that was interesting, kind of how the river um, takes care of the math of balancing uh, the, the cards. The timing and, of that, uh, yeah. The timing, right, mm-hmm. of, when you would buy, of when you would buy the more valuable cards. Um, <laughs> I also looked at the, um, the victory point cards in it and uh, how those work uh, and found that uh, if you, um, there's, a, there's a very straight math to the game where the lowest value gem is worth one victory point, then two, then three, then the highest value gem or spice, if you're playing Spice Road or, or the Gollum, Gollum Edition, yeah. is worth four. And it's, uh, it's mathed out exactly that way. So uh, a victory point card that costs you four of the four point gems gives you 16 victory points. 
Um, but there are some cards that give you an additional little bonus bump one or bump two victory points. And those are the ones that require three or four different types of gems on mm. the recipe of the card. Uh, so a card that requires one of each gem is going to give you a two point, two point bump, even though they're less valuable gems uh, mm. than something that requires four of the same gem, even if it's the highest value. Um, so I just thought it was, I was interesting how the game is all about like, almost felt looking at the game and analyzing the math behind it. I almost felt like a stockbroker, you know, that are looking for these <laughs> arbitrage situations and where they can buy a stock one second before the value changes mm -hmm. and get it at, at just a, just a, a couple of pennies, uh, you know, lower than the price should be before the price on the exchange changes. Uh, and uh, I felt like Century Spice Road kind of kind of does this and sets you up as the player to kind of look for these situations where you can jump in and get an extra uh, an extra victory point. But um, also an engine building game. Uh, yeah. And um, I think uh, that as you were saying, uh, Shu, with the game that you were talking about, uh, you know, your particular strategy, your particular engine that you're building will also diverge a little bit into certain cards being a little more valuable, a little, little less valuable mm -hmm. to you as well. Um, so that will kind of break that, um, you know, that straight kind of uh, mathematical underpinning of the game. Um, but it was a lot of fun to kind of take a look at it, uh, dive back into the game and look under the hood a little bit and kind of see see how the game how works. How it's balanced, kind of. yeah. Yeah, the how it's Funny balanced. story, like the designer Emerson Matsuuchi, um, mm -hmm. we used to play a lot of board game arena games with him and he would just keep rematching me on Splendor over and over and over again. And he uh. would just kill me all the time because he hasn't mapped out and I didn't. <laughs> so anyway, I hope Emerson's doing well, but he's fantastic. Emerson <laughs> he also teaches fantastic. game design and all of that stuff too. So yeah, he's just a fantastic guy uh, and, uh, and an excellent game designer. And I have no doubt that he is excellent at Splendor, uh, having designed <laughs> something very similar to it in Century Spice Road. This conversation is also making me think that I might never want to play a game with Ben. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're looking at games at a very deep level of like, I'm like, oh, man, uh, I've never really thought to even do that kind of math on that game. Uh, so, yeah, that might be tough. <laughs> you might do well because Christina is pretty good about mapping this stuff out, too. If but, I care to. But we'll yeah. See. yeah. <laughs> games like that, you know, one good thing that they do is they tend to keep the scores very close, right? Yes, so it's yes. going to be... Mm -hmm. Uh, unlikely that somebody wins by 30 points in Century Spice Road, right? You're probably mm -hmm. going to win by three, four, five points. So uh, it's always going to feel like a close game at the end. And you're in it, That's exactly. Experience. Yeah. yeah. I would love to talk about uh, our topic and get into your design process, Ben. So we were talking about, you know, you have very, very thematic games, which I always appreciate. Um, obviously, we had uh, Search for Planet X, Search for Lost Species. I love the biological concept of that, by the way, because my background's in biology. So I was like, oh, cool. Um, and then you have Fromage coming out and I think a new edition of Brew Crafters, too. So, right. you know, really thematic games. Um, do you start from theme first and then design? Is that is that generally your process? I do start from theme first, and I like to talk about uh, games uh, in two broad categories. One is um, uh, systems modeling, and the other being world building. Mm -hmm. uh, so systems modeling might be a game about viticulture, a game about the, uh, the wine industry and running a, a winery, mm -hmm. uh, whereas a, a world building game might be a game about um, fantasy orcs and dwarves and some kind of magical universe that they exist in. Uh, and I always gravitate toward like world building, trying to base games on real world concepts. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, naturally the theme is the thing that comes through for me first, right? So I will get um, excited about a uh, something that I see that's happening in the real world and say, oh, that's interesting. What would a game about that be like? And then try to model that in a board game. Uh, so that's where my my process starts, and it is almost always with theme. Hmm. 
What was your very first game that 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 you because I know sometimes you might come up with a game and maybe it's not published first, but like what what sort of got you into that first that that sort of theme and this game sort of started developing from that? Like the first game that I, mm -hmm. I kind of modeled based on this is, I guess my first, well, the first game probably ever tried to design was about getting uh, lost in the wilderness and kind of like uh, your plane crashing and then getting uh, kind of having to survive on your own uh, before uh, before rescue teams could find you. So uh, very, uh, very um, uh, systems modeling, right? It, it is a, a real world situation that could actually happen to you. Uh, my first published game was uh, Mars Needs Mechanics, which is about a a, a made-up mission to Mars, which is would not seem world build uh, world building. Uh, excuse me, would not seem systems modeling. But the uh, the publisher changed the theme on that, and it was actually about going to a farmer's market uh, and, uh, <laughs> and trying to get the best prices on goods at a farmer's market. So almost like maybe a Century Spice Road kind of arbitrage situation, right? Okay. Uh, uh -huh. When you go to a farmer's market and there's three guys selling tomatoes there, who do you buy the tomatoes from, <laughs> right? And how do you decide which tomato you're going to buy? There's three vendors right next to each other and the tomatoes look the same. So that was my first uh, attempt uh, to kind of model a system. And uh, it was about about a farmer's market and it somehow turned into a mission to Mars uh, where the publisher <laughs> changed the theme. But uh, yeah, that was, those are the, the first kind of couple games that I tried to, uh, uh, that I tried to model. Hmm. Is there like, of those games you've designed and the themes and everything, uh, you know, are there some that are just like, ooh, this is very, very personal. Like I love this thing and this hobby. Um, and that's like, because I, I see a couple games about brewing things at home. Like, what 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 are your interests that have translated into games? Oh man, I think. Uh, well, I think my biggest interest, if I could talk about one that's going to be coming up, is uh, is games. Of course, that is, mm -hmm. that is my my biggest hobby right now. I'm working on a game about board game manufacturing. Uh, oh, okay. of, course, <laughs> of course, I work at Panda, yeah. uh, that is the board game manufacturer. <laughs> Uh, and so I had an idea about basically making a game about being Panda and running a board game manufacturing uh, company and making board games. And so I designed that game about making board games, uh, which got picked up by Bezier. So it's going to be oh, okay. out, which, uh, should be out in 2026. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, that's so far from here. From now. <laughs> You'll learn by playing this game. Things take a while. <laughs> that's right. That's, that, that is very true. That is very true. Uh, so I think that's the one that's most meta, most uh, you know, closest to my heart. Uh, mm -hmm. and the topic of board game manufacturing. Um, I never brewed my own beer, but uh, I used to enjoy going to breweries, going to craft ah, breweries. I don't I do that as much anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I had the idea for brew crafters. Was mm -hmm. uh, while I was visiting Dogfish. Uh, head brewery in Milton, Delaware, like 12, 13 years ago. And I was on their brewery tour and I had an idea about running a craft brewery and building a craft brewery from the ground up as they were talking about how they built their craft brewery from the ground up. So <laughs> it's things like that where I'll go, oh, that's interesting. What would a game about that be like? And set out to try to try to make it in board game form. Cool. How about Fromage, which is your upcoming game about making cheese? Yeah, the uh, the story behind that is actually the publishers R two I Games. They were working on a game about whiskey, uh, and it was just wasn't quite working for them. Uh, the game itself, it just wasn't quite coming together. And I I was friends with them. We lived in the same city, and I said, "Hey, let me take a shot at this because I've got some ideas for how the aging could work, uh, the aging process of whiskey." Um, and I got into the game and had some ideas, but. Um, decided that we, uh, my design partner and I decided we didn't want to make a game about alcohol, uh, but we did want to make this game about aging something. Mm -hmm. And so we basically brainstormed what other food products uh, or drinks are aged besides mm -hmm. things that are alcohol and, uh, and landed on cheese and not a lot of great games out there about cheese. I know, uh, surprising. So it sounded like a fun, right, right? So it's <laughs> super surprising. Sounded like a fun topic to uh, um, to do. And so I, I guess that breaks my rule a little bit, but it wasn't quite theme first because it was the aging mm -hmm. mechanic that we were most interested in and then kind of moved from whiskey to cheese. Uh, 
Um, but, uh, but it definitely works. And I was able to do a little bit of research and, um, whenever I make games like this, I always, uh, you know, encourage other designers who want to make games like this too, to, to do your research, right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, go to museums. If you're making a game about something, you know, historical, go read about this topic, read some books on the topic. Uh, I did that with, with, for first in flight, I read a couple of books, um, about the Wright brothers and, um, and just, yeah, try to learn about it and put yourself in that, in that place, in that situation. So, so as you eat you the almost, whole block of cheese, you're like, this is just yeah, research. Right. Yeah, right? So, <laughs> 60 pounds of cheese later and fromage was done. <laughs> How do you, can you describe some times where, okay, thematically you really wanted to include something maybe it's like, this is a really cool thing in the real world. I would love to somehow make it fit in the game, but it just doesn't work for the board game. And it's something you had to cut. Do you have a lot of experiences like that? Sure. Yes. <laughs> uh, always. Even after being a designer for 15 years, I still make the mistake that all new designers make of trying to put too much mm -hmm. into the game and having to cut things. Um, and um, just this weekend, I was uh, playtesting the new edition of Brew Crafters that I'm working on that's going to come out. Uh, and there's a there's a, a building in there called the merch shop where uh, you know customers can buy some merch at your brewery, and it just wasn't working. It was just an extra piece that was kind of there on the side, and it wasn't really integrated very well into the actual game itself. Uh, and it was um, complexity for complexity's sake. Uh, and so, you know, the right thing to do in those situations is always to cut and to take Kill it out of the game rather yeah. than trying to, rather than trying to fix it. Uh, so, you know, I think, I don't know, and this is attributed to Steve Jobs, but I, lots of people have probably said, right, that your design is done when there's nothing left to take away. And that definitely applies to board games. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, it's almost always the correct answer is to. Um, is to take something out if it's if it's not working. Um, I'd say, um, yeah. In uh, in the the search for for Planet X, there was a lot of that, right? Because I kind of started with um, the model of alchemists by CGE as as kind of mm -hmm. a mechanics model for the game, which is another deduction game uh, and uh, that uses an app and just strip away, strip away, strip away, strip away until uh, I could get down to what I thought was the core of the deduction system, um, you know, without anything else kind of around it interfering with that. And um, so that's always happening, constantly happening. I still try to put way too much into my games and have to cut and have to have to take things out. I always think like for very thematic games, like to make it work as a game, just sometimes things have to give. Like i Love Arc Nova, probably one of my current favorite games. You're building a zoo. And like the other day, a pet friend was saying like, you, you know, raccoon is, is classified as a bear. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they even have a little like, you know, outtake in the rule book about like, there were some things we had to recategorize for gameplay and we apologize, <laughs> things like that. So, um, but it is, you know, if it makes a better game and everybody knows about these things that had to happen, mm -hmm. it's fine. You know, I think that's I the art game. side. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the art side of, of it's a little bit of a science. It's a little bit of an art and, uh, you know, can take a little bit of thematic license, um, you know, to, to make the game work. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. We didn't get a chance to play Fromage, um, but we saw it being demoed at Gen Con. So it was like, it's beautiful art. Very excited to play it. I love cheese. So, you know, it's right, right, right down my alley. <laughs> yeah, we after we saw it at Gen Con, like we didn't get again, we didn't play it. But Christina was like. Let's go. Let's get it. Just uh, based on looks and theme alone. So we went and Ben Rossett. So you know. Oh wow! Thank <laughs> you. That's so we a... went and uh, pledged for it. Yeah. Thank you so um, much. Thank you so much. It's in beta on BGA right now, and I would mm -hmm. be uh, honored to teach you. I'd be happy to teach you if, uh, if you want to play on BGA sometime. Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. would take you up on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. awesome. Yeah. And we want to save some time for Ben's topic. Can you remind us what that is today? Yeah, my topic is uh, second editions of games. And this has been on my mind because I am working on a second edition of Brew Crafters right now. Uh, and so I started thinking about um, the different ways that second editions of games uh, could be done. And 
uh, came up with a bunch of, of categories around the idea of, of second editions, ways to do it. Um, and I thought, you know, maybe I could just run through those a, a little bit. And uh, as I was trying to get my mind around things, there's, there's so many ways to do alternate versions, um, maybe second editions of games. Um, you know, there's things like anniversary editions, right? Carcassonne anniversary edition, pandemic 10th anniversary edition, maybe not a full second edition of a game, but a way to mm -hmm. refresh it. Um, there's essential editions that uh, uh, Stonemeyer and Jamie Stegmeyer like to do, which is kind of taking a base game and an expansion and then putting them together in a new altered standard base game that gets sold by Viticulture, I think is the model mm -hmm. for this, uh, being successful with this. Um, there's family or kids versions of games. I think um, Agricola recently has come out with an Agricola family version, which is only four players instead of five players and maybe makes things just a little bit simpler, maybe makes the price point just a little bit lower. There's also My Little Alchemist coming out from CG. <laughs> I've, heard of, I've heard about My Little Alchemist. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have to get that because it's. I don't think it's going to be a kid's game. I think it's going to be for you know, just a simpler version of Alchemist, maybe My Little Scythe type of uh, situation. I'm really interested in that. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me about that. Do you know when that's coming out? I've got to get They it. were talking about it at Gen Con, so I'm not, it's got to be within the next year, but I don't know when exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think it's by the end of the year, but. Maybe an quote. SN. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's all these different ways that you can do kind of you know, next edition, second editions of games. And then there's what I think is like a true second edition, which is maybe Twilight Imperium 3 versus Twilight Imperium 4, where you mm -hmm. really take the game and just update it for more modern mechanics and say, no, this is the same game, but we're intentionally improving it and re-releasing it as a better version of the previous thing that we had. And so I think that's kind of the purest form of a second edition of a game. I think Eclipse versus Eclipse New Dawn is mm. another good example of that. Um, and also Brew Crafters that I'm doing uh, and going to be released uh, probably in 2026. Um, and so, uh, you know, I started thinking more about this and like, what is the purpose of second editions? And the definition that I came up with, I hope you don't mind that I'm reading, the definition I came up with is, um, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, the intention to make fundamental improvements to gameplay that update for more modern design sensibilities. And so mm -hmm. I think that's why you would release an Eclipse New Dawn versus an Eclipse is uh, five years later or 10 years later, the game gets a little stale because game design has moved forward and moved past some of the mechanics that may have been used in the original game. And so the designer wants to go back and update the game for more modern design sensibilities. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's really the primary reason to do a true second edition of a game from the designer's point of view. Um, I was originally surprised that the community would accept second editions to games. Um, you know, I, it, it seems to be something that is happening more and more and uh, consumers seem to be okay with it. Uh, you know, I would have thought that maybe they would be upset that, oh, I already bought this game and now you're asking me to buy this game again or, you know, there's something wrong with it so you're making it better. Uh, but it, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, the community seems to be pretty accepting of second editions. And I started thinking about that and I said, well, other media does this. Movies get re-released uh, and they get updated and people go and spend money to go watch, you know, the same movie with new actors or, you know, new special effects that weren't available 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so why not, uh, why not go back and, you know, buy a new version of a board game that gets updated with better components and better art, uh, you know, and better mechanics than was available five or 10 years ago. So um, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled that, uh, that the consumers and the, the industry seems to accept second editions of games. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's just a way to, um, to dive back into something that you love and to, and to say, Hey, we can do better now and let's do better and let's re-release this, uh, and, uh, and, and update it for modern standards. And, uh, so yeah, it's a, it's interesting. I've been trying to play more second editions of games now as I've been working on, uh, on brew crafters and, uh, you know, to see kind of how designers, how designers tackle it. So it's, 
I think, yeah, because, you know, we've definitely backed and played second editions. Sometimes it's our first introduction to a game. So I think there's a natural sort of rhythm to it in board games because games just go out of print. So sometimes that second edition is going to be the way that new players can get an edition that doesn't cost $300 or something. Um, but, you know, the reception can be very different, I think, sometimes. On some second editions, people are like, yes, this was definitely smoother, better. And other people are sometimes upset because some of their favorite parts of the second edition, uh, sorry, some of their favorite parts of the first edition maybe are no longer there in the second edition. And so I think the walking that line can be really difficult for, for some designers and publishers. Yeah. yeah. And there are definitely people out there who get upset that uh, uh, games be made. I don't know if that that is driven by maybe... They, they think there's like, hey, my rare first edition is very valuable and it's like hard to get and not many people have this and now it's going to become available to everyone and they're gatekeeping on some level perhaps. Uh, I've definitely seen some people complain uh, about new editions and they don't like the art or oh, they yeah. don't like this or that. Uh, so um, One that I really remember was TMG putting out a newer edition of Genties and it was like, beautiful like all the components are amazing and i literally saw one post where like i like the uglier one better because it's more pure and i was like that's, that's just like what <laughs> but it was very much a board game geek random person so yeah i think an exercise and you can't make everybody happy right so yeah. some people that are gonna like the original version and do you think that the that the amount of time that goes by between a first version and a second version is important i think mm -hmm. if a publisher tries to release a second version a year a second edition mm -hmm. a year after the first edition. Uh, I don't know. You're asking people to buy something again a year after they bought it. Yeah. That seems more like an admission that we made a mistake and did something wrong in the first printing mm -hmm. of the game. And now we're asking you to, to pay to, for us to correct that. Uh, but I think if you get into like four five years or more, that maybe feels like an acceptable time frame to kind of release a true second edition of a game. Yeah, I think either the like, modern game sensibilities, like you're saying, sometimes even the designer, like they've matured more or they like, you know, have better ways to realize what they wanted. I remember um, uh, from Red Raven Games, he put out a second Empires of the Void because he just had such a uh, soft spot for the original one. But it was like his first game that he published. So um, made a whole new Empires of the Void, too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, too, like... Uh so sometimes some publishers will release a new version or an updated version and then they'll offer an upgrade pack for owners of the first edition to right. get certain key things. Like maybe you won't get the new box necessarily or maybe the new board, but if it's like, hey, I'm going to give you new cards or these new things so that you basically have most of the second edition, it kind of catches you up. Do you like that or do you not care? Is it is it perfectly fine way to upgrade a game? I think it depends on the amount of differences, right? For, for like, if it's within a few years, like Ben was saying, mm -hmm. and they're, they are doing this new edition and there's certain things that are better, if they can make that easy for me to catch up, I would probably just keep my first edition and update it. But if there's significant differences, like there is this whole reshape of it, then um, hopefully that was several years later and then it's a better game and I want a new better game. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to depend on the scope of the of the changes. Uh, it sometimes, like I, I know for brew crafters, it's changing enough where that kind of thing just wouldn't be possible. All mm -hmm. of the fundamental elements of the game, your player board, the main boards, the mechanics are structurally changing enough where it just you would have to sell the complete new game except for bugs, <laughs> you know, uh, and maybe some cubes if you wanted to sell an upgrade pack. So. It wouldn't make sense because you'd be buying 80% of the new game anyway. Right. Uh, so, yeah, if the scope of the changes are small enough that uh, it makes sense to, to, to make it and to ship it, um, I think that's great. And I think that's a great option to give your fan base and to give the people that, um, that already are inclined to like you and want to keep liking you as a publisher to give them an opportunity not to buy the whole game again if they don't need to is, is fantastic. Um, with some games, it's just not going to be possible because too much is changing. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's great for the people who are just those people who will complain about, uh, hey, there's a slightly better version than the one I already paid full price for. Right. Um, you kind of get a chance to appease them at a cheaper cost. Uh, I haven't had a lot of great experiences with that myself to the point where now 
generally speaking, even if it's a small change, uh, I would prefer, I'd like, you know what, it's just almost cleaner to sell the old game and get the new game and just have a clean new, this is 100% all the new stuff as it's meant to be now. Uh, like an example was the BattleCon uh, endings world games from level 99 games. These are uh, fighting games. It's kind of modeled after the video game fighting game, like Street Fighter, where two combatants are fighting and you're playing cards to kind of position yourself and try to attack and parry and position and everything. Uh, they made a new edition. They were like, we're going to clean up everything, release kind of this, a sort of their essential edition, two giant boxes, everything. But they're like, if you only want the giant boxes for storage, uh, we'll, we can also sell you an upgrade pack with the cards that you need to get your cards up to the new balance, right. which is, okay, I'll, I'll do that because I don't need to rebuy everything. But they didn't uh, update all the cardboard tokens. So all the different characters, some of them have tokens to use their different powers. Like they could lay right. traps, whatever it is. They're like, they did when they needed to, but then when you can easily substitute and just pretend this old token is now this new token, uh, they would do so. And they had a list of things. And I'm like, ah, uh, man, I'm like, I wish you would have just given me the, I would have paid for these new tokens. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so they're not named the right things. They're not uh, represented graphically as the right things because the new cards will represent the new tokens. But if you have the old tokens, you just have to make that swap uh, in your mind. And then I was like, that left a really bad taste in my mouth. So if it's small enough where it truly does just replace it, I think that would be good. But you never know, right? Yeah. It can be difficult to know if that's actually going to be accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Christina mentioned, I see it in her notes here, you mentioned Mansions of Madness as a game to uh, come out. I think that's actually one of the best examples. Like there's Mansions of Madness and then uh, the Star Wars one, Imperial Assault, Star Wars Imperial Assault. So these are both uh, the previous editions of these games. There's one person running the game. So in Mansions of Madness, this is kind of in the Cthulhu mm -hmm. universe. Uh, mm -hmm. One person is kind of controlling the mansion that the other players who are investigators are going in. They're trying to uh, t discover what's going on and they're fighting monsters that are going to be appearing. And they're dealing with all these kind of bad things that the game master is sort of running. Same thing with Star Wars Imperial Assault. One person is playing the Empire. Everyone else is playing the Rebellion. And then uh, you're, it's just one v all, which is a fine way to play. I like those games. I, I kind of like those games. I don't <laughs> like being the game. I don't like having to fight everyone and make everyone at the table uh, kind of whether they're happy or not. It really depends on me. But uh, the new editions of those games now are app driven. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you don't have to create the puzzles. The app will create the puzzles. And now everyone could just play together. Uh, same thing with Imperial Assault. I haven't played the new version of it, but now you don't need a person running the game. The game will do it automatically. And then you could just join with the rest of the group. So I think those are significant improvements because it, it fundamentally changes the dynamic of the group itself. And it kind of doesn't put that one person in that position of like, I have to balance how mean I am to everybody yeah. if I want to win or do I make this miserable for everybody so that I can win and those kind of considerations. Yeah, I think I, I think that's great. Uh, obviously, with I'm a fan of inserting apps into games to do, <laughs> uh, to do some of that work so you don't have to have a GM running the game. So I think uh, opportunities to release second editions that way, that sounds like a really good reason to me. Yeah, and then like, you know, it brought up, because there's some games that are not fully second editions, but sort of re-implementations where they might even change the name. And, and it sort of just was bringing to mind, that's interesting, like if it changes enough, is it at that point where you just want to like change the whole property name so that people don't identify it with that original one anymore. So um, just sort of interesting to think about because I was we were recently playing Middle Ages, which re-implements Majesty for the Realm, which is a lighter game also by Marc Andre, who designed Splendor. Um, right. But they fundamentally changed the drafting, um, sort of making it more King Domino style rather than just a okay. river of cards. It's into tiles now, and they changed the whole name for that. So uh, I was interested. I mean, it looks completely different from what I can tell, um, but I never played the original game. So yeah, it's just an interesting choice, I think. Uh, if they think it's different enough, we're gonna just reskin the whole thing. So. Yeah, I think that's a great question for publishers, really, to mm -hmm. answer is why would you, you know, should you change the whole name of the game, or should you stick with the original name? and 
to me, my guess is that's going to be about audience. Is it the same audience yeah. that we think will like this new skin of the game? Or if it's a different, fundamentally different audience that we think is not going to like the new theme, better to probably just change the name altogether. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure there's marketing, a lot of marketing questions that would go yeah. into that, into that <laughs> decision. Um, one, one last one I'll mention, uh, because I literally, before this podcast recording, I was looking at the new Puerto Rico uh, special edition remake. Uh, what, I don't even know what they officially called it. The super deluxe edition from Awakened Realms. So they previously did this sort of really ultra high end production remake of uh, the, Castles, the Castles of Burgundy, which is an all time classic game. And they made the best version of it from a production point of view, including all the expansions Agreed. and all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's a must buy if you like that game, although the box is gigantic. They're doing the same treatment for Puerto, Puerto Rico, but this one is based on Puerto Rico 1897. Mm -hmm. So that was of itself before the special edition Puerto Rico 1897 was a remake of Puerto Rico uh, with the in specific intent of removing the problematic elements of right. the original game because the original game involved slavery, right? Uh, you were you, part of the game was you had to bring in shipping colonists to work on the plantation. They didn't explicitly colonists, yeah, yeah. reference slavery right. or say so, but you knew that was what was happening. And then, when I, I think in recent years, as people were more kind of being sensitive to these kind of problematic issues, being more aware of them and talking about it more, uh, that's one fantastic thing about new editions is. Uh, one basis for it might just be to uh, fix some of these. Like uh, Mombasa was another problematic game about yes. colonizing. Uh, yeah. And then they rethemed it to a space theme. Uh, I forgot the name of the new game. I played it as well. But uh, uh, so I, I'm i all for this because I love Puerto Rico as a game game. Like I think it's a fantastic game. But we haven't played it in probably a decade because it's you feel bad right it's like right. I, i'm like what do i do with this game I, I love it i would love to show people to show it to people because it's a fantastic game but i don't want to play it it just it feels bad to play and so i'm i'm happy for these kind of changes in the industry as well yeah i'm uh i'm always interested to see now how publishers are handling that within within the rule book for instance i know ticket to ride legacy last year you know had a little blurb at the beginning of the rule book going uh, we know that all this land that you're about to be settling here in the 19th century was not empty. And there were a lot of people that died, mm -hmm. um, you know, as this kind of westward expansion kicked people off of their land. And um, so, you know, I think that's a good thing as well to, um, you know, to make note of that whenever, whenever possible. Uh, and I'm glad to see publishers doing more of that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Brings up a lot of things to consider in the games that you decide to play. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us today, Ben. Uh, so excited we could talk about all of this stuff and where can people follow you and what you're up to? New games, all of that stuff. What's happening in HR? Maybe not that part, but. <laughs> Skip the boring HR part. Let's talk about, we're just talking to Ben the designer today. Well, sure. Yeah, the best way uh, to catch up with me is uh, to go to uh, my website, which is www.benrossett.games. Uh, and you can see some of the things that, uh, that I'm up to there. Um, I post some uh, kind of designer advice on that website from time to time. Uh, and also when I have new games coming out, uh, kind of put an announcement about it. Uh, you can also sign up for my uh, newsletter there, which I don't even think I've officially sent out one yet. I'm kind of waiting for <laughs> Fromage to land uh, in stores before I send out my first one. So, you know, maybe once a year or something. Uh, but my, my email list is there, my sub stack. You can uh, sign up for that there as well. Awesome. You can catch the very first Ben Rossett newsletter. There you sign go. up now. That's right. That's right. Get in early. Get in early. <laughs> uh, we hope everybody enjoyed our show today. Thanks to our super editor, Mike Zipkin. And don't forget to check out our trivia show, The Board Game Quiz Show, on YouTube. We are almost done with season five, but we've got a little bit more coming. So catch up if you haven't watched it already. Um, it's a crazy hard content creator season, so you can see how you stack up. One funny note real quick was uh, when we first asked Ben, when we met you at Gen Con, and then we wanted to invite you on our show, you thought we initially meant the quiz show, the board game quiz show, and then you weren't quite as excited about going on that show than you were, as you were the podcast. So 
Well, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, this, was a, this was a great discussion. Uh, it's great to catch up with you again. And I'm so glad that we ran into each other at, uh, at, at Gen Con and, and hope to do it again next year. Awesome. Likewise, likewise. Now everybody can stop listening and go play a game. Bye. Bye. Bye.